welcome to the Accelerate webinar on Cloud Platform and Cloud Portal Business Manager. I see a few more people signing in, so we'll give about 30 seconds for folks to join in. Hello everyone, once again welcome to the webinar on Xprite Cloud Platform and Cloud Portal Business Manager. Since the time we announced the acquisition and even more so after the close, we've been meeting customers all over the world. Uh, we also had many customers come and visit us. So as always, we like to hear from you and if you have any reasons, any questions, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, you can find a welcome page right on our homepage with multiple contact aliases including a contact form. We love to hear from you. This webinar and today's webinar is about getting to know each other and also answering some of your questions. And uh, we hope that this is one of the many interactions we'll continue to have with you. And uh, before I turn things over to Nara Rajgopalan, our CEO, a few pointers in the webinar. This is a broadcast only webinar with a one-way audio. So we are taking questions towards the end. And uh, you can ask your questions by clicking on the questions tab in the go to webinar control panel. And uh, if you and the questions will be taken on a first come first serve basis. And if for any reason we're not able to cover all the questions, we will get in touch with you offline with your question and answer. Uh, also, if you're not able to see the presentation or the audio is not clear, please use the chat tab to let me know. And you can also use the chat tab to request a copy of the presentation so that uh, we can send that over to you. So with that, I will turn things over to Nara. Nara, I can see your presentation, so please proceed. Thanks, Rajesh. Uh, and uh, welcome again, everyone, to our uh, the, the first webinar for this time zone. Um, you know, we did another, another one for, at an earlier time zone for uh, audiences intended in the, in the Americas. Anyway, welcome. And um, so what I wanted to do today was take the time to introduce Accelerate to you. Um, you know, you, you were all partners or customers of Citrix, which is a much larger company than us. So, um, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity to introduce Accelerate to you and who we are, you know, who we are and what we're about. We also will talk about why we were interested in Cloud Platform, what else is in our product portfolio, and what plans we have for Cloud Platform as we move forward together. Um, to introduce Accelerate, Accelerate has been in existence for about four years. Um, we are the product subsidiary of a much larger company called Persistent Systems. Persistent Systems is a services firm, um, publicly traded about um, $350 million a year in uh, revenue run rate. Um, about 9,000 people worldwide, um, you know, so that is uh, Persistent Systems. Accelerate is the product subsidiary owned, fully owned by Persistent Systems. So we, um, you know, so we are being part of Persistent. We, um, you know, our numbers get consolidated as Persistence and uh, gets declared in the street as uh, one consolidated number. The way uh, I built Accelerate, um, you know, so we, we started Accelerate, as I said, about four years ago. And the way, um, you know, we have built the company was essentially using acquisitions of what we believe are, are software products with terrific future possibilities, but are underserved in terms of investment by the current owner. And we acquire these assets, invest, and grow. In other words, um, you know, we, we are headquartered in Silicon Valley and we are surrounded by really large software companies, examples being Intel, um, you know, um, BMC, HP, uh, Citrix, Oracle, uh, Symantec, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens with all these large companies is they have such a large portfolio and sometimes products which have terrific future possibilities that are not their core strength get ignored. Um, you know, so 
they they are not doing really well in their portfolio. So what we do is we approach these companies and tell them that we are interested in purchasing purchasing these software assets. And uh, it typically takes a little while for them to warm up to the idea of selling it, but eventually they do uh, sometimes. And we acquire those businesses, and then we invest very heavily, we and we mo move those businesses into growth areas. So that is our fundamental philosophy, and that is how we have built this. This is the fifth acquisitions we are, acquisition we are making uh, since our uh, inception. And uh, we will talk about all the various acquisitions we have done in the past and what our current product portfolio looks like as well as, as we move forward. Uh, we have a very strong global customer base today. Uh, in the telecom sector, we have customers such as Sprint, um, Rogers, Telus, and uh, Bell Canada, uh, everything everywhere in Europe, uh, or several orange properties, Vodafone Global, um, then we have several northern European properties as customers such as Telia Sonera, um, Wimplecom, uh, you know, Proximus, KPN, etc. And um, as we go further east, um, thanks to the uh, cloud platform acquisition, we now have several customers in, um, in Europe, KDDI, Korea Telecom, IDC, um, you know, I'm missing a few there, but uh, you know, uh, Airtel in India, Aircel in India, uh, Vodafone in India, uh, British Telecom in the in um, in uh, Europe, of course. So you know, so several several terrific customers. And as you all know, cloud platform is run by uh, large cloud service providers in order to run their public clouds. Um, you know, so that is the new telecom customer base that we add to the portfolio. Um, and on the enterprise side as well, we have a very strong customer base. We have uh, strong government as well as strong enterprise customers. So in the government sector, we have U.S. Marine Corps, U.S. Navy, U.S. Postal Service, um, the Ministry of Defense in uh, in UK, Ministry of Justice in UK, the the Department of Public Health in France, etc. Are our uh, public sector departments, if you may, uh, which are our customers and also several large um, enterprise customers, the likes of which you see in the screen there, Citibank, Gap, Boss, JP Morgan Chase, Gbold, um, Cartronics, which is a large ATM uh, vendor in the world, ATM, uh, they run a network of ATMs, um, Gbold, which is a large ATM manufacturer. So these are all you know, Emirates Airlines, Delta Airlines. So these are all um, several large enterprise customers of ours. So as you can tell, um, you know we have we are used to serving really large customers and used to keeping them uh, very happy and going with us. And if you are new to this uh, customer ecosystem of ours, we would be uh, delighted to tell you that uh, currently our customer satisfaction levels uh, in our surveys are north of 97%, and our renewal rate, which are you know our retention rate of our customers. Um, is also about 95%, which is very, very high in the industry. So we really know how to take care of our customers and delight them and ensure that they continue with us and grow with us. And we would be happy to um, continue to work with you and grow with you as well. Today in our portfolio, we have three different kinds of products. Uh, the first one I would like to talk about is an endpoint management product that we acquired from HP. Um, the HP acquisition happened about three years ago. And this in our portfolio is called Radia. When it used to be an HP product, this product was called um, HP's Client Automation Enterprise. And um, you know the product is essentially used by IT managers in order to manage their IT infrastructure, such as workstations and uh, servers. The idea of the product is that you could create, you can create using Radia what's called a profile uh, or a user profile, which says, which really says, okay, if you're a salesperson, your laptop has to have this version of the operating system. If it is Mac, this is what it should look like. If it is a PC, this is what it should like, look like, et cetera. And you can say these are the software packages that need to be there on, you know, in a mandatory fashion for this particular profile. And you can also say uh, what are the optional software packages available for that particular person. And then you can point Radia to a bare metal, um, you know, a machine, PC or a workstation or what have you, and Radia would go ahead and set up the image 
for that particular um, user based on the policy that you just set up. And what happens after that is you can continue to update your um, policy or a profile saying what new software needs to be installed, what new patches have to be installed, and immediately Radio would go out and update every single endpoint in the world based on the profile that you have set up. So that is the fundamental idea of Radio as at the point when we acquired the product. We have invested, as we, you know, as we usually do, we have invested very heavily in the product and transformed it from something it was into something it is now. Um, our, our, our policy, our philosophy has been to, um, you know, increase the level of product uh, investment right after we acquire a product. To give you an example, when um, Radia was HP's product, um, they probably had around 40, 45 engineering resources developing the product. At this point in time, we probably have about 130. So that is typically the way uh, we work. We, we take a product and we double, if not triple, the level of engineering investment that is in the product. And that essentially allows us to um, change the trajectory of the product, you know, uh, compared to when it was at the seller. And then as an acquirer, we're investing very heavily in order to enhance the roadmap and, and take the product to the market with a much richer portfolio. So true to our, uh, you know, nature, we invested heavily and converted this into not just a PC management, but now today it is also a mobile device and mobile application management platform. So this means that um, with this product, you can now manage not just PCs, but uh, your Android phones or iOS um, you know, phones or tablets or what have you as well. Not just the security policies, but what applications need to be rolled out for each of these devices. So now you can say, uh, this is how a salesperson's phone should look like or a tablet should look like, et cetera. And these apps would be appropriately uh, pushed out. The, the user would be able to get an enterprise app store from which he can download further applications and install it. So this makes it the only uh, application in the world today with a fully unified, it is, it is not just a veneer, not just a front-end UI integration. The same underlying extremely scalable IT infrastructure um, now manages PC servers and mobile devices, which makes it the only product in the world which is capable of doing this. Um, all of the other products either are, uh, you know, multiple products with a common UI in the back end, which means that it behaves fundamentally differently on the PC side and the mobile side, or, uh, you know, other competitors of ours, you know, might have a strong uh, product on one front, but a very, very weak product on the other front. You know, we are fully featured on both sides, not just on the mobile, but on the PC and the server side as well. Uh, along with doing these things, we do uh, security and compliance, which means that you can say, uh, you can go out and find out which machines are compliant with the policy and which are not. And, uh, you know, you can take corrective actions for, on devices which are not compliant. Uh, we can also do thin client and VDI management. We do PC and servers, as I mentioned, and one of the most exciting developments, you know, we have been developing this product called Radial Live for the past year or so, which takes the product that, you know, essentially is an endpoint management product now and takes this into the realms of endpoint security and cybersecurity. So Radial Live is a is an add-on product to Radia. It can be added on not just to Radia, but any other traditional endpoint manager as well. In other words, if you're a Microsoft SCCM customer or an IBM endpoint management customer, you could add Radial Life as an adjacent product. And what this allows you to do is, is allows you to secure these endpoints in a very um, interesting manner. So today, as we know, um, you know, perimeter defense is, is prevalent in every single uh, enterprise, which means that you know, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, what have you, are, are there in every single enterprise and, and uh, you know, SME. The, every computer also has some kind of an endpoint protection, which means that you know everyone has installed some kind of an antivirus um, or something like that in every single PC, so that the PC itself is secure. But in spite of all of these efforts, machines get break in, broken into, and um, you know, and enterprises get broken into uh, as a as, as a routine, right? So what happens is the hackers that are after these enterprises, they have the same exact software and they are able to get in because they've set up sandboxes and they know how to attack these things. Often they get in using zero day attacks, which means that these are vulnerabilities in 
in um, you know software that you have installed across any of these servers or um, endpoints, etc., in your end of, in, in your network. But these software are known to have certain vulnerabilities, and uh, or at least these these hackers find these zero-day vulnerabilities, which means that the um, the vulnerability is, is brand new. It is not yet fixed by the software vendor. And the hackers get to know of it, and then they are able to get into your network using that particular vulnerability. And once they are inside your network, they're able to expand and find other machines with the same vulnerability, and they're able to do you know severe damage inside. Examples of this are the target attack where uh, you know someone is able to take a compromised um, login from an air conditioning HVAC vendor, and they're able to get into the point of sale terminal in a, in, a, in a store. And from there, they were able to spread their wings and go into Target. And you know, they essentially installed some kind of a, um, you know, a, a malware on the point of sale terminal, which read the credit card numbers from the memory. And it was able to grab that and send it out. So you know, uh, about a year and two months later, Home Depot was attacked by the exact same vulnerability. And it, you know, Home Depot had not um, secured themselves from the same exact problem. So these are problems that exist today. And when you come to know of this as an enterprise IT manager, what you would like to do is immediately go out and find every single machine with this particular signature. You know, you know these signatures of the zero-day vulnerability, and they are being published constantly. Uh, but they are not yet fixed. And what you want to do is immediately go out and search your hundreds of thousands of PCs and mobile devices and virtual machines and servers and what have you to find out which all have this vulnerability and immediately go fix it before the vendors are able to roll out something for it in the next month or two or what have you. And this is what Radia Live allows you to do. What it allows you to do is create any random signature. This could be you know, give you examples, which register is open, which uh, port is open, which register is set in a certain way, does this file exist in the, in the machine, is there a certain software of a specific version installed, it could be any of those things. Uh, you could create anything completely uh, customizable and say go and find every single endpoint in, in my world which is vulnerable or has been compromised. And Radio Live would go out, scan every single endpoint, and within 15 seconds to 20 seconds, literally, instantaneously it would come back after having scanned hundreds of thousands of devices in seconds it will come back and tell you which machines are vulnerable and you're able to take corrective action right away so if any of you are in the security area um, there is another company called Tanium perhaps the only company in the world today that does something like this and they are um, you know they, they essentially created the market for this um, incidentally we had been developing this technology in parallel and we have launched it just now. So you know, our um, you know, this is sort of, if you may, the second generation of the technology that is needed in order to do this. So does this in a very unique fashion, very fast, um, and we have the correction possibility because of Radia. You know, you can take the um, the problem and fix it right away because we also have Radia, and using that, you are able to fix the problems. And you know, we could also roll out the fixes using an SACM, etc. As well. So which is taking the corrective action once you know what the problem is. So this is taken um, HP Radia. And now, you know, as Accelerate Radia, it now becomes not just a PC management product, but it is a fully unified PC server, ATM, point of sale, uh, whatever, uh, mobile device, mobile application manager, along with the ability to, um, you know, do cybersecurity for all your endpoints as well. So that is a typical trajectory of a product in our portfolio. Right, so I just wanted to take that example and go into a little more depth um, because you know I wanted to give you com a comfort feel that once a product comes into our world, it'll get a very heavy level of investment and transform into something much larger and much more interesting than what we acquired. The other thing that I want to talk about is a um, is a Pona in our portfolio, which is in the Internet of Things world, and this is a product line that we acquired from Intel. And when you acquired the product from Intel, um, this was this had two forms. So one, um, it, it has a very large telecom telco customer base, and what it is used by telcos is for exposing an API to their uh, telecom infrastructure. So if you're a telco, and if you wanted to expose an API for your developers to be able to uh, not your developers but your ecosystem developers, you know who are um, 
you know, who want to send, let's say, a text message, or retrieve a voicemail, complete a voice call, or send an MMS message, or maybe you wanted to expose your payment APIs. Um, in other words, you wanted your developers to be able to launch, um, you know, uh, uh, an app in an app store or something like that, but you wanted the telco to be able to bill for that particular application and share that, um, you know, that payment with the with the developer, etc. All of these APIs were available as part of uh, Epona, um, and Intel had invested heavily in converting this from just being an API infrastructure into being an IoT service development infrastructure. So, in other words, if you have a connected device in the IoT world, this could be, you know, gosh, you know, if you were a appliance manufacturer, this could be a home appliance. You know, this could be your refrigerator, espresso machine, etc. Or it could be, you know, it could be a Fitbit type of, you know, consumer devices. Or this could be a large industrial driller or, uh, you know, earth mover or any of those as well. So any anything that is connected, um, you know, to the, you know, using any protocols, it be Bluetooth, low energy, what have you, and that has a gateway. Essentially, what Intel had created was you could take Epona's infrastructure and define a service or create an application, if you may, for managing that particular connected device using Epona. So it is a it is a platform, it is an IoT application creation platform which can connect to devices which expose any kind of protocol such as you know MQTT or CoAP or you know standard REST or over serial interface or something like that. You can connect to a device using a defined protocol. Um, and you can define these objects, their object models, their behavior all in a drag and drop. Uh, application creation environment so without having to write a lot of code you will be able to create an application with very low le levels of effort and you could do application creation analytics uh, software deployment creation of APIs um, you know how to monetize all of this all of these aspects were taken care of by the product when we acquired from Intel um, but you know what it what we thought the world needed was what not another IoT platform, which is great to have. So you know, you know, today in the world there is Amazon IoT, there is IBM Bluemix, there is PTC, there is GE Predix, uh, PTC as a product called ThingWorks. This was yet another IoT platform, and which we thought was not needed, um, or you know, or we we thought that as as a small company like Accelerate, we will not be able to compete against um, a growing market. With the same, you know, with a full, fully baked, um, a fully closed environment, if you may, for application creation. But what we instead did was, we took that platform and made it more interesting, which is we made this the only uh, cloud-neutral IoT development infrastructure. So we analyzed all of these other platforms, and they they did not have the the tool set that Epona had in order to create these applications in a very fast and very rapid fashion. So what we did uh, since the investment is we have taken the product and converted it to be able to deploy a created application on any of these IoT platforms. So you could develop an application in Epona and go and deploy it on Amazon IoT, or you could deploy it on IBM Bluemix, or you could deploy it on uh, GE Predix. So the fundamental idea being we now take this extremely powerful IoT creation platform that Intel had created, and now we are giving our users platform independence. You could alternately if you were a telco, you could tie Epona to Cloud Platform and offer a service similar to Amazon IoT. And you know you could now launch an IoT cloud yourself. But if you were an enterprise, you could now choose to deploy it within your own enterprise, um, you know, the, the newly created IoT application. But alternately, you could go and deploy it on Amazon IoT, or you can go and deploy it on IBM Bluemix if you've already picked that as your platform. So now with Epona, we give you platform independence. So you're able to go and deploy this application in any platform in a nascent market where you don't want to make a platform decision the way all of these platforms are developed today. Once you pick a platform and you develop an application on it, you're tied to that platform for the rest of your life. Whereas with Epona, you get the independence. You know, you could either deploy it within Epona or you can go and deploy it in a competing platform as well. So this is something very unique that we developed and we've uh, just launched. We are winning customers for that now. Um, you know, we are, we are beginning to make announcement of customer wins soon. So you would see that, uh, you know, our unique nature of being able to do uh, IoT development the way we do it is getting a lot of uh, press coverage from the market as well. 
and that brings us to cloud lifecycle management. Um, so this is this has also been a three-year journey for us. Uh, we got into the domain of cloud maybe three, three and a half years ago with an acquisition of a company called uh, Doyens, which was a small to medium business disaster recovery as a service vendor. So the product in our portfolio um, that we acquired from Doyens is a is a product called R Cloud. R Cloud is a small to medium business disaster recovery as a service. We run the service. You know, when we acquired Doyens, uh, Doyens had data centers in the U.S. Uh, offering disaster recovery as a service to its customers. Um, you know what this really means is that if you were uh, SMB, let's say you know uh, you're a doctor, or a dentist, or a small bank, or you know small company, etc., which have a few servers, and you want a DR for it, you could run an agent on these machines and point this agent to the cloud, uh, to our cloud. And all the nightly backups, or uh, you know what have you, the snapshots of the images of these machines. Uh, would be um, compressed and uploaded into uh, into the cloud, and um, in the cloud, these will be converted into virtual machines. So what happens is essentially, you know, the, the the machines configuration, the images, the network configuration, all of these are constantly being uploaded uploaded into the cloud by our cloud, the our cloud agent. And if you have a disaster on prem, you can go to the um, you can go to the our cloud uh, site. And you can recover your environment by clicking on a button. All your servers would reboot in the cloud, and you would get disaster recovery right away. But the product is intended for an SMB audience. Um, um, so if you're a carrier on the call today, um, you know we would love to see if you know we can partner with you in our cloud, and we will be able to launch our cloud in your cloud, and you would be take it to, able to take it to market in your area. Um, but you know we we offer the service only in the U.S. And the reason. We acquired this product was we 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 aren't as much focused on SMB. We are more a, a medium to large enterprise as well as a telco uh, vendor rather than a SMB player. So, but the reason we acquired this product line was because we were interested in taking this fundamental technology, underlying technology of our cloud, and you know convert it into an enterprise play, where we will be able to do an enterprise uh, disaster recovery service or a disaster recovery product. So, which is what Rovius is. is Rovius is a um, is a product which is instead of relying on nightly backups or backups every 12 hours, it is capable of doing continuous replication. It supports VMware and bare metal environments today. So, if you have a VMware or a bare metal environment, we are able to take the images, uh, continuously replicate it into a second site, and give you disaster recovery on a second site. So, if you know Zerto or SRM or any of these products, this is an equivalent product in our portfolio. Uh, so these were the products in our portfolio um, prior to the cl cloud platform acquisition. About two years ago, we had approached Citrix and um, expressed our interest in buying uh, cloud platform. And at that time, it did not go um, go any further. So we ended up acquiring a smaller company called Converture. Converture had a very similar product line. Um, the product was called Convert. It was essentially very similar to cloud platform in the sense that it was another management system as well as a self-service management layer on top of KVM, VMware, Zen, and Hyper-V. But it also had one extra functionality, which was that it was also a hybrid cloud management system, which means that as a, as a cloud service provider or as an enterprise, you are able to expose a common UI to your customers for both an in-house infrastructure such as KVM or VMware or something as well as an Amazon UI. So if you were an enterprise, instead of having people go directly, each line of business go to the uh, go to uh, Amazon and create their own account, you could have a single unified account for the enterprise and expose a UI, uh, which is Amazon, as well as your internal cloud, and you know set up privileges for your users, saying who is allowed to do what, and what is the quota for each of these things. And uh, you know now you have a common uh, UI and common uh, spending for your internal cloud as well as an Amazon cloud as an enterprise. So this hybrid management functionality was something that was unique in Convert that was not there in Cloud Platform. But you know, since, since we had launched Convert and we were pushing it out in the market, and uh, you know, Citrix came to us and said that you know they were interested in selling Cloud Platform this time around. Uh, it was competitive. There were other vendors in the fray, and we ended up winning this bid. But um, you know, what we are doing with this platform. Um, is you know we are keeping the the hybrid management functionality 
in convert and at some point in time we will merge that uh, we will merge that functionality into um, into a cloud platform but until then convert would be the product we offer to the market for the hybrid cloud management functionality and uh, cloud platform would continue to be what it is and the convert customer base is being migrated into cloud platforms as we speak so that we have a single unified product in the market so that is our um, current cloud story and uh, we are very excited to have cloud platform in our portfolio um, you know we are uh, you know, we have already increased the engineering team by 10, 15 people, and we will continue to, you know, do that and have a much larger team developing and uh, growing the product as we move forward. Um, so the, the kind of things that we want to do with Cloud Platform as we move forward, um, um, the kind of things that we will be investing on would be to move, um, to move Cloud Platform into the areas of containers, um, uh, also in being able to do, uh, you know, several other things such as, you know, uh, a better SDN support, uh, better object store support. Uh, we are working with several vendors in the ecosystem, so you will soon be able to see that uh, there are lots of other vendors um, in these areas such as storage vendors and SDN vendors, etc., who are partnering with us in order to launch their support for cloud platform as well. So you would see very soon a thriving ecosystem of third-party vendors uh, in the ecosystem who will all start supporting cloud stack, cloud platform. Um, and we will be integrating these other features that we have in other, other products of ours, such as DR and backup and things like that, and bringing that into the phrase, into the portfolio as well. So we are very excited to have this in our portfolio. And uh, you would see um, you know, fast progress of the product as we move forward. So those were the, um, the those are the slides I had. I wanted to open it up to questions and see if you have any questions and how I can address those questions now. Hey, thank you, Nara. So I can actually see a lot of questions coming in. Um, are you able to see it, or do you just want no? To I'm not it? able to see it. Yeah, I think you have to cut and paste it in the chat. So I think the first question uh, comes from Germany, and I think you answered this through your presentation. But I'm going to put it in your chat. Just give me a minute. There are multiple questions from this uh, gentleman. So, um, Nara, it is going to be in your chat window. Multiple questions. You should see it now. Okay. Um, I'm just reading through it. Um, some, since the organization is in Germany, where CP, CPBM is based. Okay, let me let me address these questions. So, uh, the first question is: Are cloud platform CPBM secure in a in an investment sense? Absolutely, as as we said, we think the products have great legs. And uh, in fact, you know, if you just look at CPBM, um, it doesn't. It, it, there is no particular need why it should be then just for um, cloud platform based um, infrastructure, but it should really be a much more generic. Um, infrastructure which can manage anything else a service provider offers you know this could be you know five other services which are not based on cloud platform but they all need a front end as well so we are basically looking at a roadmap for CPBM which would not just limit it to being able to uh, be the front end for a cloud platform infrastructure as a service but a plug-in architecture where you will be able to do multiple things in the background as well so this is something that we are investigating so whoever this customer is if you can write to us and tell us you know what what we would like to do is set up a call with you and understand what else you would like to see uh, in CPBM and how it must grow we have already been on a road show talking to a few customers here in the US uh, and in Japan and Korea etc and they have given us their requirements so we would like to hear yours so please write to us and set up a call so our product managers can talk to you and understand your need and how we can potentially um, expand CPBM moving forward but as I mentioned I didn't mention CPBM too much during the call um, but you know uh, again it will also have a very similar roadmap you know we would we would be continuing to invest in that product as well but as I said in you know, a cloud platform uh, should be 
you know, a much, uh, a very interesting product going forward. We would see a lot of investment in it and it will continue to grow. And uh, the other question here is that the world uses OpenStack. Is CCP CloudStack the right solution and why? Um, the, the question really is, you know, uh, look, you know, we are part of the OpenStack ecosystem as well. If you go to the OpenStack Foundation, you would see that Axelorite is probably the second or third name. Um, so we are paying members of the foundation. We love OpenStack. Um, we, we don't think uh, anything negative of it. I think the CloudStack, OpenStack war was a war of three, four years ago, and it is an irrelevant war today because the world is moving on from being a, a purely virtualization world into something which is converged and which is, uh, you know, partly, you know, how do I deal with a, a converged storage infrastructure? How do I deal with containers? And how do I deal with an environment where all of these things come together? And everybody, you know, VMware, OpenStack, CloudStack, everyone is trying to move to that promised land. And the war of yesterday of OpenStack versus CloudStack is not even an interesting war anymore. That is a war from three, four years ago. Um, you know, well, what you would need as a infrastructure vendor two years from now is going to be far different from what any of us do today. And that is the promised land and VMware, us and, you know, and OpenStack are all trying to get to the promised land now. You know, there are guys like Nutanix who have come around and who have a completely different way of looking at this problem. And they are solving it in a completely different way. And that is, you know, raising some questions. And Kubernetes is now out in the world and they are solving the problem in a completely different way. You know, Docker, which was considered the preeminent, um, you know, container vendor, uh, now is being looked at as just a container vendor, and Kubernetes is now being looked at as the uh, infrastructure for managing. You know, it is not the Docker swarm anymore. I mean, the world is moving so fast and changing so fast. The OpenStack versus CloudStack was, um, you know, are passe and are from yesterday. And today, the the the, the world is moving much faster and into a much more interesting place, and that is a place we are highly interested in. So we would continue to invest in cloud platform, but you would see us moving very fast towards, you know, how do we deal with convergence? How do we deal with containers? How do we deal with, um, you know, SDN requirements, which are now having to do deal with these multiple multiple competing needs, et cetera. So, you know, we are, you know, we are headquartered in the Valley. Um, you know, we fundamentally believe that having, um, you know, the open source, open, uh, you know, ecosystem is great in being able to bring in multiple vendors, but it has its own negativity, right? I mean, in other words, you know, if you look at cloud platform, which was a monolithic system when it was developed, it was not open source. It is able to today run, uh, you know, the largest vendor, uh, largest customer of cloud platform runs 22,000 nodes um, is the size of the cloud they run, 22,000 nodes. I mean, this is phenomenally huge. And there are no OpenStack deployments which was developed in the open source at that level. You know, you go talk to a vendor like Mirantis, they're going to tell you if you get to 200 nodes running OpenStack, you should be ecstatic because it's, it's a chaotic environment. Um, you know, there are advantages to being small and being stable and being able to move at a rate much faster than when 5, 10 competing 10,000 people companies are checking code into a branch with competing needs, competing architectures, which is why OpenStack has had a very, very rocky life for the past five, you know, uh, three to four years. With, whereas Cloud Platform, CloudStack has a much more stable environment. Now the, the momentum, the velocity has not been there and we would fix that by investing very heavily and bringing vendors into the ecosystem that makes sense, et cetera. But we would continue to support the open source uh, platform. You know, we will continue to be part of CloudStack. Anything that is relevant to um, the open source environment would continue to be checked in. We would continue to own, um, you know, significant chunks of it. We are increasing our level of contribution, the number of committers. We would have more PMCs in the project, et cetera. But we would also continue to in evolve cloud platform in uh, in a more rapid fashion. So hope I mean that is a long answer, but uh, you know, absolutely, we would have a roadmap on both the products, and you would see us moving at a much faster rate into the world of tomorrow rather than world of yesterday where, um, you know, which is not that interesting. It's, um, you know, you need to be able to deal with the challenges of tomorrow and we will get you there as cloud platform customers. So, um, so Lord, just to follow up there about uh, close to a little over a dozen questions there. And, and uh, there are some questions that are repeated. So just to, you know, reiterate again, folks, please get in touch with us. More than happy to engage with you. 
By the way, we also are hosting uh, two major events in London around Cloud Platform and CPBM. This is uh, on April uh, 5th and 6th. If you'd like to have more information, we are happy to send. And, you know, Nara and some of us are going to be there at that event too. So, Nara, please continue with the next question. I think this is related to the roadmap for CPBM integration into ACS. And if that would Yeah, be so as I said, you know, ACS is, uh, you know, Apache Cloud Stack. Now, you know, the CCP would be called ACP or Accelerate Cloud Platform. So, um, and as, as far as we are concerned, you know, CPBM integrating the Cloud Stack, et cetera, it, frankly, I think it should be able to integrate with OpenStack. It should be able to integrate with anything else in your back end. We want to have CPBM to be a completely open front end platform, which is not limited to just infrastructure as a service based on Cloud Platform. So um, again, these are early days in our roadmap thinking. So if you have needs, um, you know, reach us and write to us and we would set up a call where we can understand your needs more clearly and more specifically. But, um, you know, there are, we, we already have a similar front end in our portfolio as part of our API management functionality. And we are trying to figure out how we can merge that into this and add monetization as well. You know, um, as part of our Epona platform, we have a monetization product which is very interesting and we are trying to merge all of these roadmaps and come up with a unified product set. So please do uh, write to us and set up a call where you can express your CPBM uh, needs and interests and roadmap requirements, et cetera, to us so we can make the right uh, roadmap decisions on that front. Um, how do you plan to interact with the Cloud Stack Apache community? Um, let me make sure I've not missed any questions prior to that. So that one, uh, as I said, we will continue to be, um, so you, know, you, you already see that as part of the acquisition, we acquired all of the Citrix folks. Citrix had uh, a significant number of developers in, actually it, it turns out that Citrix had far fewer uh, PMCs and committers because you know, all of the people that were doing the work in the back end, uh, all their work was being funneled through one or two people because they didn't want, you know, they were trying to retract from the community. Um, so they didn't want to be seen because they were part of the OpenStack Foundation and they were throwing their, um, you know, they, they, weren't, they were unsure about their strategy on CloudStack. So in a sense, even though 80% of the contributions maybe um, in that range into ACS were from Citrix, they weren't seen as a major player because they shrunk from it from a visibility perspective. You know, they had one or two people funneling 50 people's code into the branch. Um, it is not because Citrix had stop developing the product, but it is because they didn't want to be seen as a major player there. Um, we are changing that. You know, we will continue to be a big supporter of the CloudStack community. We will continue to, um, you know, we, we do believe in open source and uh, we think it has its great advantages. So we will continue to um, be um, more visible, um, but we will continue to, you know, contribute everything relevant to infrastructure as a service back into cloud stack world but we will be doing more things as we move into other new areas which are evolving infrastructure as a service into other areas that might you might start seeing some new functionality some new things being part of cloud platform and not part of cloud stack we are trying to draw the line between what what is cloud stack and what is cloud platform as we move forward but we will continue to be great supporters of cloud stack community to the infrastructure as a service level and everything we do um, will be contributed back there um, and we will be more visible than, than Citrix was. You would see us more taking more control, taking more, um, you know, taking or, you know, owning some of the conversations, having more roadmap items, etc. How will the licensing model change? Um, is that the next question? Let me make sure. Uh, uh, at this point in time, we haven't contemplated any change to the licensing model. So everything would continue to be the same. Um, Citrix had uh, both a perpetual license as well as an annual license, um, annual um, license for uh, uh, cloud platform. And they had this all you can eat perpetual license for cloud uh, CPBM. The CPBM model um, most likely will have to change. This all you can eat model um, is the reason why CPBM wasn't getting any investment from Citrix, which is a very unscalable model. So we expect the CPBM licensing model to change, which would scale in a similar fashion to cloud platform. You know, the way Citrix had structured the pricing, you know, essentially there was no new money coming in 
once they sold it to a customer and that is the reason CPBM was highly starved of investment. Uh, and the fact that CPBM by its nature is a services oriented product. You know, every time you go to a customer, it requires customization. Um, you know, and Citrix was not geared towards doing these kinds of customizations. Now, the fact that, um, you know, um, as Accelerate, we are part of Persistent Systems, which is a large services company, allows us to be able to do a lot of service extensions to these products as well. So we are open to that uh, type of model where the product is part product and it needs some services to be extended. Epona, which is another product, you know, fundamentally is a product like that in our portfolio where each time the product is sold, uh, it requires services and customizations in order to make the product work the way the customer wants. So we are used to this model, and we are happy to have CPB in our, in our portfolio, which is in a similar model as well. So we will, um, as we invest and grow CPBM, the licensing model for CPBM might change. Uh, again, at this point in time, it is speculation. I think it will change given the way it was structured. But other than that, on the cloud platform side, we do not uh, contemplate any licensing model changes at this time. Um, can you tell us when CCP 4.7 will be released? Um, as they would say in the Caribbean, soon come. <laughs> Uh, but it really means it will come soon. Um, you know, the, the, the final uh, touches are being made, so it should be within the next month or two we'll, we'll release it. It could be uh, as soon as a few weeks. Um, we just need to, you know, ensure that it is tested well, et cetera, before it is released. Uh, as uh, I don't know how many of you know, but in 4.7, um, you know, there is much better level of bare metal support, much better level of uh, Citrix uh, NetScaler support. There is CoreOS support in case you wanted to manage containers. Um, you know, so there are, there are a few things that are happening on that front. 4.7 should be out in um, hopefully a few weeks, if not a uh, month or two. Uh, what SLAs are in place for technical support? Um, so you should come in. So we have um, so we have a standard support program, which is uh, 9 by 5, as well as 24 by 7. Then we have a premier support, uh, which gives you a higher level of support. And then we have a premier plus support, which gives you even a higher level of support in terms of uh, you know, regular touch points for project management and uh, you know, your dedicated people who would pick up the phone and answer and you know, um, shadow environments of your environment, et cetera. So we serve telcos day in and day out and very large enterprises day in and day out. So we understand support needs at that scale. So our support programs are geared towards, um, you know, high customizability. You will be able to get a standard 9 by 5, 24 by 7, or Premier, uh, which is a much higher level of support, or Premier Plus, which is a highly customizable program. So again, write to us uh, in one of the links that we have given at the welcome page or in the email that you got, and we will be able to, um, you know, answer those questions in a much more intimate fashion. Uh, by the way, uh, the way the support transition happened, we are not thrilled with it, but you know this was the best we could do given the support we got from Citrix. The way it has been done so far is that every customer who probably ever created a bug on cloud platform in the Citrix world, Citrix told us that they, uh, had give, they have given us the entire list. We're not entirely sure if that list was complete, but they say that they've given us a list of everyone who had ever opened a bug in Cloud Platform within Citrix. And what we have done is we have created an account for all of those set of users and sent out an email directly saying that you all have a, a new account in our support portal. But it turns out we hear from users all the time that even though they had opened uh, several tickets in the Citrix world, they did not get that email. If you were one of them, please write to us and we will immediately take care of that. Um, so your, the support data has been migrated over. In other words, if you were a company within the Citrix world and you had several um, bugs open, et cetera, you would see a history of all the bugs, um, the existing open bugs, the status, et cetera. You would see it right away. But if you don't have an account, just go to our web page and uh, you know, write to support. Uh, there is a support email address there in the in the welcome, um, uh, you know, welcome cloud platform and cloud, um, um, you know, CPBM customers is the first link you would see on the Excelrite.com site. In, if you click on that, there is an email address to contact support. So please click on that and write to us saying what your needs are, and we'll immediately create an account for you. The whole account transition between us and Citrix has been less than stellar, um, 
I'm, uh, I'm happy to report that, but that is the case. And we would love to fix that. So please write to us so we can immediately create an account for you. Um, so that was the SLA question. Then there is a question for, um, you know, how would we continue to uh, test how we would continue to interact with uh, Apache Cloud Stack? Will Cloud Platform and Cloud Stack builds now change significantly? We don't control Cloud Stack. As you know, it is an Apache project. Um, you know, um, we are part of the, uh, there, are, there are two people who are responsible for the 4.9, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know what they're called, build managers, release managers, something like that. I don't know the exact Apache term. But that is actually jointly being done for the next release by Cloud Ops and us. Um, so, you know, we don't expect um, any change to happen there immediately. Uh, there has been competing needs from the community. There are some people in the community who have asked for a much more rapid release of CloudStack, and some people in the community have asked for, Citrix's opinion was that it should not be anything more than three to six months because it took, you know, Citrix, and we today run, I don't know, um, 600 servers, 600 nodes worth of data centers where we test this and then release it, et cetera. So Citrix's opinion was that each release has to go through a month or two of testing cycle because they had tens of people testing each of these releases before they would put it out. And their opinion was that um, you know, in a really fast cadence of release was not ideal for them, and they wanted to be able to ensure that it is tested and um, you know, fully baked before they released. So these are competing needs in the community. We are trying to grapple with all of those and figure out where our head lies. Um, immediately speaking, we don't have a strong opinion on how these things would change. We would like to be there and learn. Um, you know, we will do as the, the, the community cadence changes, we will change with it and we will, we will continue to talk with the people in the community to figure out what these competing needs are, et cetera. So uh, immediately speaking, now that, you know, the, 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 it's probably been, what, 21 days or 20 days since the deal closed. It's not been that many days. So, you know, we don't expect any change right away. But as our thoughts um, solidify further, uh, we might, um, you know, we might start influencing some changes in terms of release cycles, et cetera. But at this immediate point in time, we don't have a strong opinion one way or the other as we learn, uh, uh, you know, how the community works because we are new to the Apache community at this time. Um, how will custom code slash special requests be managed? Um, as I mentioned, um, in our culture, as Accelerate, this is already there because we own a product like Epona where each customer has custom requests and customization needs, et cetera. So we are used to this. So um, write to us, and we will figure out a way to deal with your needs. Um, again, the easiest way to do it would be to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us. Tell us, look, you know, I'm on, a, on this particular branch, and I need this change, and you know, no one else seems to want it, but this is very important for me. I'm sure we can come up with ways of meeting your needs. Uh, again, as I mentioned, um, we, we are used to the world of telcos where um, you know, a standard product in the telco world almost doesn't exist because every telco has unique needs. And we have this whole ability of having standard code branches and custom extensions. And you know, we, we have that almost down to a science. And we know how to do this extremely well. So write, write to us and uh, tell us what your needs are. We will have your, uh, you know, the product managers and the local uh, systems engineers reach you and find out what your needs are. And we will be able to take care of that. Will there be any changes in the support contract? So if you are in the middle of a support contract, that support contract has been assigned to us. In other words, we will now be serving those support contracts instead of Citrix. Uh, you should and absolutely hold us to a much higher um, level of support than what the Citrix would have given you. We are a smaller company. Um, we are all about ensuring that our customers are dealt with uh, extremely well. First, before we think of anything else, you know, I would rather you know, they say that keeping a dollar of revenue is much easier than acquiring a net new dollar of revenue, which means that keeping a customer happy and ensuring they don't walk away is much easier than going out and getting a brand new customer. So as an existing customer, you are the most important people for us. Um, you know, we will ensure that your needs are met before we think of expansion, and net new revenues, etc. So as 
your new vendors hold us to a much higher degree of uh, expectation than you did Citrix. And if you're not able to meet, uh, meet that, please write to us and tell us where we are failing and we will ensure that that is fixed right away. But uh, your existing support contracts are in place, but you should expect a much higher degree of uh, support from us than what you were used to prior to this. Let me see if there are any more questions. Um, will CCP 4.7 be based on 4.7, 4.8, or 4.9? That is a tad too technical for me. <laughs> I believe 4.7 was branched off of 4.5, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I believe there are changes in the main branch which are not there in 4.7 today. So ACP 4.7 as far as I can tell, is slightly different from CCP 4.7, but I'm, I'm not down in the depth at that level to give you great answers. And again, please write to us. We'll be happy to set up a conversation with our product manager, so we will be able to answer that. How will the Zen server be supported in Cloud Platform? Uh, Zen server would continue to be supported in Cloud Platform, but the Zen server support contract that you have with Citrix is still with Citrix. Um, we are working with Citrix on being able to officially support or resell, um, you know, Citrix sold Zen server support as part of us so that, you know, we have a relationship with them where we are able to deal with Zen server support requests and cloud platform support requests in a unified fashion. And if we need code changes in Zen server, we're able to file a bug with Citrix and get it back to you, et cetera. Um, that conversation with Citrix is in its early stages. Um, it will perhaps take us. Um, not because we are moving slowly, but it's just that, you know, these things take a little while to put in place with large companies. Um, you know, hopefully in, you know, within within a few, you know, a month or two, we will be able to roll out the Zen Server support program. I don't have anything more than a hope at this time because um, it's in the works and I can't guarantee you any date by which it will be done because it's not just us. You know, we have to work with Citrix there as well in order to make sure it is done. Um, but for now, your Zen Server support contract is with Citrix, but we will be able to debug uh, at least at a level one, level two perspective where the problems lie and tell you if it's a Zen Server problem or our problem. How many people from the original cloud platform CPVM teams moved to Excel right with this acquisition? So 100% of them moved. Uh, everybody moved, um, you know, to Excel right. Um, uh, you know, it looked like I might have to say 99% or something, but even the last guy took the job, so uh, everybody moved over. Uh, how will you be working with the former Citrix Cloud partners, Cloud Ops, Shadow, Indicus, etc.? Uh, we, in fact, I think we've reached out to all of those three. Um, and we have active conversations with all three. And, um, you know, um, uh, I don't know the status of, uh, you know, what has been signed versus not, et cetera. But, you know, we would continue to work with the ecosystem partners. Um, we believe in ecosystems and all of other other sites, other products as well, Radia, um, you know, Epona, et cetera. We have SIs and partners, which is a thriving ecosystem around us. Uh, we actually get more business through our partners um, than we do direct, and um, you know we, you know um, any partners, you know we we actually take take them into deals with us as uh, local wars and local service providers, etc., who can extend the platform. So in the same uh, fashion, uh, you know we have reached out to to all of these guys, and uh, you know hopefully something would be in place if it is not already in place soon. Um, so yes, you know. Um, you know, there are conversations happening and there are um, there are relationships being built. Um, you know, I can't tell you anything that has happened or not, but, you know, you if, if it has, anything has happened, you would uh, hear a press release from us. Will you be contributing back commits patches from CCP to ACS upstream? I'm not sure what upstream means. Um, um, again, perhaps a question more for our product managers, perhaps a tattoo technical for me. Um, but again, write to us exactly what the question is, um, you know, in an email, and I will be happy to uh, connect you with the product managers, and they should be able to get you an answer. Uh, how would you handle upgrades to a higher cloud platform version? Um, I think there is a a program called um, Upgrade Assistance Program, I believe, which might even be free or little little to no cost something like that. So we're happy to help you move up from a version 
a version to another version, etc. Um, there is a program in place if you have not heard of that from Citrix. Citrix already had a program called Upgrade Assistance Program. Uh, we're happy to talk to you about that and find out how we can get you more information on that. Then please write to us. Uh, could you handle upgrades? Okay, that is the last one. Uh, will Citrix Netscaler be fully supported? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, 4.7 has a much higher level of support for uh, Netscaler controller or something as it's called, controller, control center, something like that. So um, the level of integration is much higher in 4.7, and uh, we are working with the Netscaler team in Citrix to figure out how we can get some of their newer products into the fold. Uh, they're coming out of the containerized version. We we think it has great legs, and we are trying to figure out how we get that integrated into our product. So lots of conversations happening there, but uh, our relationship with Citrix continues to be very strong. And um, you know, Zen Server and um, Netscaler integrations should continue um, as strongly, if not better, than before. Okay, that is the last question that I see on the chat list. Uh, Rajesh, are there any more coming? Uh, no, I think that was the last one. So also there were, <clears throat> excuse me, a few of the questions that were uh, similar to others that you already addressed. So, you know, I kind of uh, left them out. Uh, so at least for all the attendees, you know, thank you for participating on this webinar. You will also receive a mail from me, like a thank you mail, hopefully within an hour from now. And, and if you need this deck, uh, please write to us. We will also take a note of some of the questions that were a bit too technical for NARA. We will have them answered to you proactively because we've been capturing all these questions and your contact information. And also, I think some of you caught up with the uh, update on the event that I made, which is, you know, NARA will be speaking at an event on April uh, 5th and 6th in London. Um, this is about the business of data centers um, hosted by 451. So some of you want to learn more about that event. So yes, I will reach out to you, and if others are interested in meeting us at that time in London, please let me know. We'll sign and see how we can uh, schedule some time for uh, Nara and the rest of the team to get in touch with you. Um, before concluding, as always, once again, thank you. And unlike most companies, you know, we love to engage, we love to work. In fact, as soon as the acquisition was announced, uh, Nara went on a world tour, uh, literally around the world, uh, different countries, different continents. Uh, from South America to Europe, Asia, then Korea, Japan, and then back uh, North America. Um, and yesterday we had customers from Japan come over to our offices. So, you know, things are back up again. We are investing. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us by any means necessary. You know, there's a welcome page. There's my email. All that good stuff. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, you know, until next time, um, you know, we'll have another webinar. But until next time, let's start be in touch over email. and. Um, uh, look forward to working and building an exciting roadmap for cloud platform and uh, cloud portal. Thank you, and with that, we'll conclude the webinar. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.